nine, classified as a second felony offender, offense manslaughter, sentencing date, January 14, 2002, sentenced to a total of 30 years, parole date, August 1st, 2021, good time, October 23rd, 2023, full term, April 17, 2029. Is this information correct? I have the answer. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Wise. Mr. Wise, can you hear us? Ms. Francis, how long have you been out on this charge? Two years, as of April the 16th of this year, we'll make 22 years. 22 years on a 30 year sentence. You know, I've seen you've done some good programs there, Ms. Francis, and I also, uh, uh, what programs are you in at this time? Are you just in the transitional work program? Just in the work release program, how many disciplinary write-ups you had, Ms. Francis? None. You ain't had none, and you've been in the transitional work program over a year, about a year, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, where are you working at? I work at KFC in Faraday, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken in Faraday? Yes, sir. Where are you going to live when you get out? I plan to stay with my daughter, Erica Key. Where's that at? In Lafayette, Louisiana. Lafayette. I see you've had your anger management, uh, true freedom program, living in balance phase one and two. You've done some good programs here that I see you've, uh, took the money management programs uh you're classified as a low risk uh, i don't have any other questions i don't see any other questions okay okay our first speaker will be mr damon sam who's a son Hello? Hello? Mr. Samson, can you hear us? Mr. Sam, yes, sir. Mr. Sam, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Okay, we can hear you. You've got music on in the background. Can you turn that off? I don't have, no, I don't have any music. That's the dry, as the dry as I'm at work. Oh, okay. Uh, why don't you go ahead and this is uh, your mother? Yes, sir. Okay, why don't you tell us what you'd like us to know about your mother? Well, it, it, it's been 23 years. Like my, my, my mom been gone since I was 20. I'm 43 right now. You know, like it's been a struggle taking care of my little sister them. But you know, like she got all kind of family support. You know, like she did her time for the charge that she took. You know, so like we just, Pray and hope that she come home. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam. We have another participant that has just joined, Ms. Erica Key daughter who will be speaking in support. Ms. Key, is it? Ms. Erica Key? Yes, sir. Uh, ma'am, if you would, uh, you've unmuted your, your phone, your mic, would you tell us what you'd like us to hear, please? Yes, sir. Um, I would like to speak on the behalf of my mother. Um, it has been a long time, you know, um, we all grown now, and now she have grandkids that need her, you know, and she really has a strong family that's willing to support her and that has been supporting her throughout the years. 
And I think truly that she has done her time and is a blessing and an opportunity on today, hopefully for the best. Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Thank you, sir. I appreciate y'all for having me. Our last participant is Ms. Loretta Perot, who's from the victim's family. Good morning. Hi, Ms. Perot, how are you? I, I was doing good, I'm holding on. Okay, if you would just uh, tell us what you'd like the board to hear, please. I would like to say um, on behalf of my family that I would like to ask that she be denied. Um, I'm listening to everyone speak um, about her um, serving and doing pro different programs, but I'm also hearing the family members say um, how there is family waiting for her and grandkids and you know how they're uh, needing help and support, but I've taken a loss to me and my family also. And no one, I just lost my mama almost a year ago, but having no other siblings, I had to raise my sister, nine children. And still today, I'm still struggling and fighting now to help to raise the grandchildren. And so for my sister to never have the joy of ever being a part of their lives, and for me to hear now from Miss Helena to come back to Lafayette while I am right now, and to know the shocker for me right now is that I've been knowing Mr. Sam, her son, for quite a while now, but never once up until this moment put it together that that is Miss Helena's son. And if that was any remorse, and I hear them speak of her going through different programs and her anger management and that's for but to look at her smirk and her gestures of her face as you are speaking to her still does not speak in the volume to me. I know that she being locked up is not gonna bring my sister back, nor the time lost, nor cover the hurt and the pain and suffering that my family has. But for me to just imagine her coming home to her loved one to be able to embrace them holding her, them having cookouts, them experiencing the things that my sister never got with her kids because they lost their mother at a young, young age. I feel right now that even though she's still locked up, the pain, the hurt, the suffering, the glory, I will never get that joy. It doesn't matter she served a hundred years, but to know that she can come home and be free and to still pick up life and go on, I'm asking that she be denied. And whatever time it is that she have left serve, let that be a time for her for her to realize that everyone suffered. And I'm hurting here today, still with no mother, one brother out of a, a large family and the struggle and the toll that has taken on me, mentally, physically. And I'm asking you to deny her. Thank you very much, Ms. Perot, for your comments and thank you for being here today. That is all of our speakers, Mr. Marabello. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Francis, is there anything you'd like to say uh, before the vote, the board votes? Yes, sir, there is. I regret the incident that happened. I'm not that person anymore. And if, it, if I could change the incident from happening, it would be solved in a different manner. I'm very remorseful for what I did. I have to live with that for the rest of my life. I think about it every day, my actions due to my drug use. And, and I just wanna apologize to the family and ask for forgiveness. And that is from my heart, I am really sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Francis. Is the panel ready to vote? Mr. Wise? Yes, you know, at this time I looked at this, you've, uh, You've been incarcerated 30 years on, you've been there about 23 years, according to some jail credits and everything. But, you know, one of the things that we look at is what you did since you've been there. It's a program you take. We asked you to take these programs. 
you got zero write-ups. You've had very good programs. You got family support and your age. You're classified as a low risk. You've been in the transitional work program for one year. No incidents in your work. And I said it again, no DBs. That says a lot since the time you've been there. Today, I'm voting to grant the conditions to be set by the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Wise. Ms. Uh, Jackson? All right, uh, first, let me thank all of our speakers who appeared. Uh, we appreciate hearing from each one of you. Um, it helps us uh, inform our decision. Uh, to Ms. Perot and uh, to her family, I'm truly sorry about the pain that you're experiencing. I know it was very difficult for you to appear today and express your feelings. And I know that this is difficult for you. Um, and there's nothing this board can ever do that's gonna change. Uh, you're not having your sister and, and the grief and loss you feel. Uh, but our job today isn't to focus exclusively on the crime. Uh, I will tell you, Almost every crime we look at is horrible in so many ways. There's always a victim or victims that are suffering as a result of the offender's crimes. And so if the only thing we ever looked at is what the person did 20, 30 years ago, then there would be no point in this board existing. Our job is to look at all of the circumstances, the crime itself, who the person was back then, and who they are now. And Ms. Francis at age 63 has served um, 23 years of a 30 year sentence. She has gone that entire time without a single disciplinary write up. That is very rare. That is very rare. We almost never see someone who has conducted themselves in the way that she has. Uh, she has taken every program that's available to her. Uh, she earned the right to be in the tra transitional work program. Uh, she has performed there without any incident. Sometimes people go, they mess up, they get kicked out of the program. She's not done out any of that. So uh, I don't know that there's much else that she could do to demonstrate that she is a person who can be safely released into the community. And so my vote today would be to grant because she's a low risk. She's had no disciplinary write-ups in 23 years. She's taken good programs. She's served a significant amount of her sentence and she has um, good family support. So for those reasons, my vote today is to grant. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, Ms. Francis, uh, I've listened to everyone here today. Uh, I would also like to thank all of the speakers uh, and especially to Ms. Uh, Perot. I'm very sorry uh, for your loss. I'm sorry that uh, for the grief and the pain that you've suffered and I appreciate the courage of your being here today. But as both of my colleagues has point, have pointed out, we're here today to determine who Ms. Francis is today and what she's accomplished since she's been in prison. And she has accomplished a lot. And uh, I agree, I'm not gonna reiterate all of the things that my colleagues said, but I agree with them. Uh, my vote today would likewise be to grant uh, her parole uh, with the following special conditions. Number one, that she obtain a substance abuse evaluation and follow whatever treatment is recommended. Uh, I'm also going to order that she do that. I'm going to I'm going to uh, make a condition that she attend two AA meetings per week, at least for the first six months, and more or less 
if the evaluation uh, requires that. And I'm also going to make a condition that she have no contact whatsoever with the victim, with the family of the victim in this case. Uh, Ms. Francis, your parole has been granted with those conditions. Uh, good luck to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Man, you know, I kind of felt the same way that the victim felt. Uh, the faces that she was making were very, I don't know, kind of like, you know, it started with when Jim Wise said, do you have any write-ups? And she's like, write-ups? There's just something unsettling about it. Um, she seemed very, but the parole board had made up their mind and they were going to parole her regardless. So she, she committed this crime in 2002. And we'll go over the info Richard found. I don't know how he finds this stuff, uh, but this is like just some random blog posts from some random somewhere. Um, she was sentenced to 30 years in 2002. And, you know, of course she got a parole much earlier than, than that. She had her, her, uh, this, this, uh, well, she got it 20 years later. So she served, you know, most of her sentence and she had no write-ups and she was doing everything she had to do. Um, so they paroled her. But she has stayed out of trouble. We don't see her. Uh, but, but the you know what was just particularly disturbing again is that while the sister was speaking, the son, her son and her were just the faces that they were making were just so. You know, it was just upsetting to see that. Really, it was. Um, and the crime she committed is also just disturbing. So this is um, this is what it is. I'll read it to you. The sister of woman's professional basketball player, Kim Parrott, has been stabbed to death and police have booked the woman's roommate in the killing. So, you know, they even the reason that this even got like some type of article actually it was linked to sports illustrated and that's uh and someone like copied and pasted it here or something and that 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 link is now dead so we have it just in like this google true crimes group thing um so lynette parrot who is a 36 year old mother of nine was stabbed in the back with a knife saturday night police said she stumbled to the home of a neighbor who called authorities but she later died at the hospital. Then Helena Francis, 34, was booked with second degree red rum. No bond has been set. Police said jealousy may have been a motive. A funeral was held Tuesday. Parrot's brother Craig and the two women had troubled relationship and the victim had packed up all of her belongings a few weeks ago with a plan to move out. Parrot had nine children ranging from age seven to 17. They were not in her care at the time of the death. Wow. Um, Parrot's sister Kim is an all-star player for WNBA's Houston Comets. She recently had surgery to remove a golf ball-sized brain tumor and underwent radiation treatment for smaller tumors she was scheduled to soon begin chemotherapy for lung cancer as well oh my god now i'm curious to know how she did that's just wow you know what i'm gonna google her hang on yeah there she is and she actually died that year she did not survive it she died at the age of 32 if you can imagine getting through life, what she had to get through, making it as an all-star, you know, basically just doing everything that she could do to make the best, which is quite incredible. And then to get just rocked by all that type of cancer to die at 32. And she would have had to have heard about her sister's death is just, it just makes you wonder. It's such a tragedy. 
Um, but there you have it. There you have it. And with that, I'll let you go. She's classified as a second felony offender. She has a parole eligibility date of September the 10th, 2022. She has an adjusted good time date of February the 4th of 2023 and a full term date of September the 11th of 2025. She's currently serving a four year sentence on the charges of uh, possession of methamphetamines and possession of heroin. Uh, having been uh, revoked and sentenced on December the 2nd of 2021. Was all of that uh, fairly accurate, uh, Ms. Barbe? Yes, sir. Ms. Barbe, how old are you today? 47. Okay, and how long have you been in prison on these charges? Since November 18th of 21, 2021. Okay, so how many months is that? How many? Nine months. Yeah. Nine months on a uh, four-year sentence? Yes, sir. Ms. Barbie, as I, I look at um, your file, uh, are you familiar with our STAR program? No, sir. Okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, uh, when you, prior to your being arrested, were you using heroin, painkillers, or any other opiates? Um, yes, sir, but I was on drug court, um, and so I stayed clean for a, a little bit. Okay, well, there in yeah. a second. Okay. Uh, what was your drug of choice? Uh, pain medicine, opiates. Uh, and did that substance abuse or use contribute to your incarceration? Yes, sir. Do you have a sobriety or relapse prevention plan? Yes, sir. Once you're released? Yes, sir. Uh, we have a uh, we have a, a substance abuse program. It's called the STAR program. We'll talk about that in just a few moments uh, uh, and see if that may be something you may be interested in. Let's talk a little bit about your drug use. When did you start using drugs? alcohol at a young age probably 13 and okay. uh, when did you start drinking at 13 at 13 is when i started drinking alcohol i know what did you start drinking oh, what alcohol it was beer um and then shortly after it turned to hard liquor shortly after being what 15 16 uh, probably 15 and how did that occur? How did you start drinking at that early age? Um, I had a loss of a, a close family member who I was living with. My um, It was a cousin who I looked at as a sister. And I, my mom was an alcoholic. And so there was alcohol there. And uh, it just became easy to, to use alcohol to, to numb myself through that loss. Were you living with your mother at the time? Yes, sir. And uh, did you continue to drink until you got incarcerated? I continued to drink until I was put on pain medicines, <laughs> and, that's, and then. How often were you? How often were you drinking before you switched to pain medication? Um, I, not not daily, but it was a, I mean, probably three times a week. Um, occurrence. Let's talk about the drugs. When did you start taking pain pills? Um, I was 22. Uh, it was in um, 97, I think, 1990 or 98. Okay. And what happened in 1998 that got you on pain pill? Pain pills. I have a. Um, I have back problems, back issues that I've dealt with my whole life. But in 97, I had an injury, I had a fall off of some um, steps and I landed on my tailbone and it put me into in the process of starting to get pain medication until I could have a surgery. I decided to not have the surgery because I was too young and I had young children and 
uh, that just kept going on and on until I continued to medicate instead of fixing the problem. When did you start self-medicating with heroin and uh, other drugs? I was 38. So, um, 38. And uh, how often were you using heroin? It was only when um, I would be out of my medication, just when I would get sick from not having my medication. So it was maybe, maybe once a month. When did you go into drug court? On, um, in 2019, I think it was in April of 2019. How long did you stay in drug court? Until uh, I was revoked November 18th of 2020. I'm just jumping in to say that I'm hearing that noise too, and I have no idea what that is. Maybe it's a microphone. Maybe it's the air condition in the background that the microphone's picking up on. But yeah, it's not just you. So sorry about that. But it's not me. It's not coming from my computer. From court a year plus? Yes, I was. I did an in I did a inpatient residential inpatient um, for almost eleven months. And at, uh, at Apple in Appaloosas at uh, Wellness Residential. Okay. And how did that go? How did why did you get revoked? Um, I went home, COVID hit, I couldn't get to court proper in, in the right amount of time to get out. I should have graduated, but in the meantime, my mom had a couple strokes and I had to move in with her. I wound up relapsing and, um, and they needed a, a hair follicle test and I couldn't, so that kind of started the whole process over. I couldn't give them a clean, uh, urine test. I mean, a clean, uh, hair follicle test at that time. And how long have you been in, and were you using while you were in rehab? No, sir. When did you get out of rehab? Um, June of 2021, I mean, 2020. And you went back immediately to using what, heroin? It took me until, um, no, it was, um, I actually uh, used meth. Um, and it was in November of that year, May, October and November, the, almost the end of the year. What, if any, plan did you have when you got out of rehab to stay sober? Uh, well, the plan was to stay in a recovery um, type setting, uh, continue to go to an IOP. Well, de describe to me a, uh, a recovery type setting. What what was their recommendation for you? They, I had been um, approved to live in an apartment. I moved to Lafayette, but I was going to be put into IOP, um, which I was going to go through daily uh, while I was. Hey, was going to go. Through. You didn't go through it. No, sir. I want my my mom had her stroke. I had to move home, and um, I started taking care of her. And um, never went to IOP. I was still in drug court. I was thinking I was going to graduate and I would have time to. Where were you in drug court? Uh, St. Landry or Lafayette Parish? Iberville. Iberville Parish. Iberville Parish. Yes, so, where are you from originally? How'd you get in Iberville Parish? Uh, I'm from Bruley. Uh, Plaquemine is where my dad lives uh, in Iberville Parish. I'm from West Baton Rouge, from uh, Bruley. You consider yourself to be a drug addict? Yes, I do. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. So what would be your plan to stay sober if you were to get released? Uh, the, the biggest difference is that I'm uh, willing to try the Vivitrol shot um, to go home into a transitional home until I can get uh, situated with Everything I need. To let's, let's talk a little bit about the Vivitrol shot. What do you know about that? Uh, that it helps your cravings um, from opiates. How did you learn about that? I am in a class uh, here in um, in Tallulah that teaches about addiction and opiates. What class is that? It's the, it's the MAT program. Okay. Okay. That, that's that's uh, 
Uh, that was the whole point in my discussing with you the star program, because uh, uh, I don't know that I would would order uh, that you uh, enroll in a medically assisted treatment program. Uh, but if that's something that you are interested in, I think that that's something that may very well be helpful uh, to, for you. So you've looked into that. Is that something that you are interested in trying to do? Yes, absolutely. I've already uh, discussed it with the, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm already signed up for it. I'm signed up to get and it. You're not taking it now, though? No, I'm, I'm waiting on that on the naltrexone to be um, approved and to start taking that here. But okay. I'm going to take a Vivitrol shot upon release. Now you are in a program now, the MAT program. How long a program is that? It's six months to a year. Okay, and how long have you been in it so far? I've only been in it for maybe um, Almost three months. Almost three months. So you've got about six months left to complete that program? It, it just depends. Uh, hey, good morning. I'm Haley. I facilitate the MAP program. Um, Thank you, Haley. Please tell us a little bit more about the program. Um, it's, like I said, it's a, it's a never ending or starting group. We just get, I try to get them in between three months to a year so that they would have at least 90 days, three months of treatment. Um, I would like to have them a little longer, but it, that's the minimum. Um, so we offer the nail tracks on while they're here. And then I'm a peer support specialist, so I'll continue to work with them after their release. I set up their aftercare if they want to go to sober living, if they want to go to, um, you know, I, outpatient, I OP, I get all that set up, and then I continue to peer support with them as they leave. Um, yeah. And we work with their probation and parole. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the ultimate uh, verdict is going to be today, but if, uh, if I were to recommend, or if this panel were to recommend that as a condition of her parole, she complete or at least go through your program sufficiently enough to be released, would she be in there for another couple of three months to make sure she's got everything under control? Um, no, because as soon as Fred's hit, you'll be because as soon as credits hit, she'll be released. What I did is set her up with an inpatient. I believe she's been going through a lot with her her mother passing and um some family situations. And honestly, I believe the um and some type of treatment for sure would be what I would recommend. Well, what, what I'm, I'm suggesting is, is that I'm thinking right now, perhaps I may vote to parole her, but I'd like to see her stay in your program a little bit to make sure that she's got a good foundation. Is that something you don't think is necessary? Or uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to find out. I mean, you indicated it's, it's three years, I mean, three months to a year. You'd like to keep them as long as you can. I'm suggesting maybe we keep her in there a little longer to get her footing, uh, making sure that she's tolerant to the uh, medication before we release her. That's that's what I'm asking. Is that not something to suggest or recommend? Um, sure, we're waiting on her. She's just the prescription to come in for her meds, and I'll still mentor her as she's released and as she's in the free world or wherever she goes to a, if she goes to a um um wood lake if we get her in there i can still mentor mentor with her work with her even when she's released from there um so that so there's nothing else the program that she's in now can do for her is i guess is what i'm, I'm asking because I mean, my thought right now is perhaps vote to grant, but let her stay in your program another couple of months and make sure that uh, she's got everything straight. Uh, but if you're telling me, no, that's not something that she would need, then that's not not an avenue I would explore. This is, sir, was she, was she saying the reason that she won't be able to, co to, to continue in her class, Danielle has completed risk management. And all she's waiting on are the are the credits to hit. Once those do, 
she's immediate release. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not following. All right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now, did I understand that your mom has passed? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to hear about that. I, I, uh, part of your plan was to go back and take care of her. Yeah, um, my plan was to go home and take care of my mom. And now that she's passed, um, we have a lot to take care of with a, a succession with me and my sister. And so I feel like a transitional home or even an inpatient, whatever um, whatever I decide is going to be some follow-up with my care. But you have decided that you want to take the medication. Absolutely. Thank you. That's that's all the questions. Anything you'd like to say, Ms. Barbe, before uh, we vote? Just thank you for your time. I appreciate you um, being so thorough. Uh, Ms. Barbe, uh, it, it appears that uh, when you complete your programs and all your paperwork is done, you're going to be released. So uh, my vote today is uh, to deny you, not because you haven't done the things you need to do, but it would be foolish for us to do anything other than that. You are going to uh, take the medication. I think it's a wonderful program for you to do. And I hope that you do follow up uh, with all of the information uh, and uh, the suggestions that are made to you. So good luck to you. Thank you. Ms. Jackson. Uh, yes, um, Ms. Barbe, my vote is to deny for the same reason. You're on the right track. And once you get your credit and with the prescription, you'll be able to go up to you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Labe, uh, I'm really impressed with the, the, uh, the work you've done on you and that you plan to continue to do that work. Um, and you've got a good plan with the uh, transitional housing and the medically assisted treatment. I do agree with my colleagues. You're going to be an immediate release anyway when you get your credit. So. Um, based on that, I'm about to say to the night for all. I wish you well. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Good luck to you, Ms. Bogg. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Well, I guess that's when being denied parole is uh, considered a good thing. The good news is that it's been a, a little more than a year and we don't have any news on her. So she's she's doing well, which is wonderful to see. Sadly, we see now that we're keeping track of the follow up uh, with Richard's help. Um, we see so often that we do see them back, but no news, which is good news. You know, if, if she's on the shot, I may have missed it, but it's that shot that is, is quite interesting, which, which they offer through the STAR program. And we don't see a lot of people on it, and I'm not sure why, but it takes a certain kind of commitment, and basically it makes it not possible to get high. Um, for it, it takes away the euphoria... Um, effects of alcohol and and I think opiates, which is quite remarkable. So those who are really rock bottom, we see those who seem to be genuinely at really want to get better, ask to be put on those shots. And we have seen hearings where it seems that, that they want to get better, but when asked about getting on the shot, they just say no, they don't want to. And I kind of don't blame them. It's It seems kind of scary, but you know, uh, using all that, all the narcotic garbage, it's not like it's much better, right? <sighs> Drinking, it's not like it's much better. It's not like the alternative, you know, if you want to say, well, I, I want to say completely healthy. It's like, yeah, but let's, that's all I have really. And I guess we can move to the next hearing. This is the matter of Robin L. Brown, date of birth. December the 14th of 1980, Ms. Brown is classified as a first felony offender. She has a parole eligibility date of October the 29th of 2022, an adjusted good time date of June the 24th of 2023, and a full term date of July 29th of 2023. 
Uh, she is currently serving a three-year sentence on aggravated assault with a firearm, having been sentenced on March the 3rd of 2021. Uh, Ms. Brown, is that basically correct? Yes, sir. Ms. Brown, your case has been assigned to Ms. Bonnie Jackson. She will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she may have? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Jackson. How are you today? Blessed. Hi. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions. Just find out a little bit about you and your situation, okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you're, you're 41? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any children? No, ma'am. Um, how much time have you actually served uh, on this charge? I've served two years and one month. Okay. Uh, did you ever make bond when after your arrest, or did you stay in jail until today? I stayed in jail until the day of my arrest. Since the day of your arrest? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Oh, you got two counts of aggravated assault with firearms. Uh, one of the victims was your cousin, and the other one was his 13-year-old son. What happened? And why did you end up uh, pulling a weapon and threatening your family? What, what, what was happening? Yes, ma'am. Actually, it wasn't my family that I threatened. I'm not um trying to make no excuses for what I did, my actions. It was my cousin gun that I did, but it wasn't toward my cousin. It was toward his friend. But my cousin was trying to get his gun from me and I was backing up. I didn't want to let it go because I didn't want it to go off just in case he grabbed it from me. So I backed up from him until the officer came. That's when I released the gun. Well didn't you, uh, you didn't just have, okay, let's start here. Why did you have a gun? Why did you have your cousin's gun? Ma'am, at the time, the, the person that I was actually mad with at the time, he had stole something from me. And I asked him to give it back. And he said, he's not giving me an effing thing back. Get it in blood. He stole my cell phone and money. Well, I'm just looking at what you tell the police. Yes. Um, when they asked you, you know, why you reported, why you have a gun, you said the victims told you to get it. And then they asked you why you pointed the gun at them and told them he never picked the gun up. So this is kind of different from what you were saying today. Uh, who is David Stovall? It's my cousin. Okay. Derek Jarvis was a witness and he said that you, uh, he saw you go to Mr. Stovall's truck, come out with a rifle and pointed at David and Dylan Stovall. So David is your cousin and Dylan yes. is his son. Yes. And apparently the witnesses said you pointed the gun at, at your cousin and your nephew, or his cousin, or his child rather. Uh, and we got information that your cousin indicated that he had asked that the charges be dismissed because you were drunk at the time. So he couldn't ask charges to be dismissed unless he was a victim. Okay? Yes. So let's talk about let's talk about your being drunk at the time. Talk about that. Yes, ma'am. Were you drunk? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you have a drinking problem? Yes, ma'am. At the time, I have. Okay. Well, tell us about that. When did, at what age did you start drinking? And then how often did you drink? And how much did you drink before you got arrested? Yes, ma'am. At the time, I was drinking vodka. I was drinking it every day. And like, how much? 
like a pint a day. Okay, how old were you when you started drinking? Ma'am? How old were you when you started drinking? Like 33. Nobody starts drinking at 33. Yes. When I started drinking hard liquor, it was at 33. So when I did you drink a little beer or a little wine at the time, but nothing that's, you know, strong. Again, alcohol is alcohol. But how how old were you when you had your first drink? Um, I 20, 22, 21, 22. So how did you drink and get out of control? Well, it's not making any excuses. I went through something in life and I just to block out the pain, I just turned to alcohol. And what'd you go through? Abuse. Were you working at the time? Yes, ma'am. What kind of work were you doing? I was working in a restaurant. Uh, doing, doing what? I was a uh, prep in the kitchen, prep chef. They call it a prep chef. When you prep the uh -huh. food. And how long have you been doing that? Maybe about a year and a half. Now, I was looking at your rap sheet, Miss um, Brown. You are classified as a first felony offender. So I am acknowledging that this is your only felony conviction. But what I'm saying is a lot of arrests on your record uh, for crimes of, of violence. I show that in 2003 in West Baton Rouge, you had an aggravated battery with a dangerous weapon. You remember getting arrested in 2003 for committing a battery against someone with a dangerous weapon? Yes, ma'am. What was that about? That was the same thing. It was just uh, some a misunderstanding with somebody that threatened me and that threatened me and I just uh, got a weapon for him. What kind of weapon? A gun. Is that a knife? It could have been a stick. I'm not going to assume it was a gun, but I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. That's the only charge that I remember having with a, a female that was back in the year 2000. Shakira. Oh, this, this was actually 2003, is when you got arrested. And then I show that in 2004, you pled guilty to a simple battery. You got six months. You were placed on probation for two years, and that probation got revoked in May of 16. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. What was the charge you said in 2003? 2003, you got arrested for aggravated battery. In 2004, you got arrested for simple battery. You pled guilty to that. You got six months. It was suspended. You were placed on probation for two years. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, for some reason, it's showing in 2016, the probation was revoked. But I don't know why it would have gone that long. Well, let's move on. Yes, also, Later in 2004, that was the first arrest in 2004 was in April. In May of 2004, you got arrested for a simple assault, but that charge ended up getting dismissed. Uh, also, in June of 2004, you were arrested for aggravated assault with a firearm. But that charge got dismissed uh, in 2005. Uh, in 2012, you were arrested for threatening to burn somebody's house down. You were, you were arrested for 
communicating of false information of planned arson, which usually means you told somebody you were going to burn your house down and you ended up pleading guilty to aggravated assault and you got 90 days in parish prison. You remember that? Yes, ma'am. Oh, tell us about that. Actually, that was my sister. <laughs> it's a misunderstanding that I was involved. You know, Miss Miss uh, Brown, you know, in all of these misunderstandings, you're the common denominator. Right. right. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So it's you. Yes, ma'am. In 2016, you had a simple criminal damage to property. Whose property did you damage? This was on April 18, 2016. Uh, in June of 16, you pled guilty to simple criminal damage to property, and you got 100 days in parish prison. Do you remember what that was about? Yes, ma'am. What's that about? That was actually uh, Edward Stovall, somebody I used to, uh, met, you know, was in a kind of relationship with. What did you do? What did you damage? Well, he said I damaged his fence. That's what he said. He said somebody told him that I did it. He didn't have no extra proof, but he said somebody it's, told him that I did yeah, it. It's brown. It's brown. I'm listening. You know, you know who damaged the fence. Yes, ma'am. You damaged his fence. Yes, ma'am. So why are you talking about he said? I mean, you were there, you know what you did. Yes, ma'am. I'm just saying that's what he said. Somebody told him I did it. So I told him I did it. But you didn't do it? Actually, I didn't, but I told him I did. All right, Miss Brown, that's your story. Yes, ma'am, that's the truth. <laughs> Why are you so angry? Why do you lash out all the time? Uh, at other people, you know, threatening them, threatening to burn your house down. Uh, why? Why are you so angry all the time? Well, at the time, I was taking all my pain out on other people. I was hurt and I wanted them to feel hurt. Why? Because I was abused by a lot of men. They were mostly me, my victims were mostly me. Except your sister. Except your sister. Yes, except my sister at that time. So what kind of classes have you taken, Ms. Brown, since being incarcerated? Well, actually I've taken, um, I got my GED. I have uh, four certifications in forklifting, heavy machinery, core and OSHA. Uh, those are all good programs. They help you with some job skills, but I don't hear you talking about anything that's going to help you with your substance abuse and your anger problem. Because you can have all the skills in the world, but if you're still an alcoholic and you still uh, get angry and lash out at people, those skills aren't going to, being a forklift operator, you might run over somebody with a forklift. <laughs> True. <laughs> So what have you done to address the reason you keep committing these crimes? God, baby, ma'am. I'm sorry for calling that. God, I've been oh. praying. I've been doing a lot of stuff in church. Ma'am, ma'am. You haven't taken any substance abuse programs? Oh, ma'am, I signed up for a lot of classes, but they, they said I don't have not getting none yet. And I've been, uh, have taken so far the ones I signed up, the ones they put me in. Have you ever been diagnosed with any kind of mental health issue? Have you ever been told that you have mental health issues? No, oh, ma'am. And you've not taken anger management, you've not taken any kind of substance abuse treatments, is that correct? No, oh, ma'am. Uh, what, can, uh, what can the staff at the prison tell us about Ms. Brown? 
Is there anyone in the room with you, Ms. Brown? Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, and you are? I'm April Jones. I'm, uh, I did the, I was over the forklift, the CTE programs. Uh, she was in our program and did very well, uh, completed everything without any problem, very excited to do the program. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Maribel, let me tell you. Hand. Now we'll hear from uh, your sister, Ms. Sheena Brown. Ms. Brown? Yes, sir. Ms. Brown, if you would uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know about your sister. My name is Sheena Brown. My sister is a very caring person. She has family that loves her. We actually cannot wait for her to get home. She has a host of nieces and nephews that are excited for her to get home. Um, she's just a very loved person. She knows that. Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Ms. Carmelita Wilson. Yes, sir. Carmelita Wilson. Robert Ms. Brown. Wilson, go ahead. Tell us what you'd like us to know about your sister. I'm very excited for her to come home. She have a um, new new uh, nieces and nephews that she haven't seen yet. Um, she will have my support. Um, I am a manager at the casino, so I do plan on helping her get a job and get on her feet. Um, She's more than welcome to come and live with me and my husband. Um, I do have some classes that I can have a go to for um, substance abuse or anything y'all need her to do. I can take her. By me being a manager, I can't have a lot of time off and take her. She will have my 100% support because I'm very excited for her to come home. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Ms. Brown, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before the board votes? No, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Some board ready to vote? Yes. Ms. Jackson? Hi, Ms. Brown. I, I commend you for the vocational classes that you've taken. I think those will be helpful to you when you get out. And so I'm glad that you've taken up forklift fork training and that you've done well in that. But I'm concerned, uh, Ms. Brown, because of your history of alcoholism and your history of anger issues. You look shocked that I said you were an alcoholic. You just told us that you were. Um, and you haven't done anything to address either your anger or your substance abuse issues. And so I don't think you're equipped right now to get out. You need to go through anger management. You need to go through a substance abuse uh, program. You're going to need a lot of tools that you don't have right now uh, to make sure that you don't get out, start drinking vodka again, get mad at people and want to do things to help. And I just don't see that right now you're ready to take on that. So, and you will get out um, in July of next year. So, my vote today is to deny because of proximity to your good time date and for lack of programming that would help you. So, my vote today would be to go in. Ms. Brown, uh, I do agree with my colleague, Ms. Jackson. You, you know, your history of, sub, of substance abuse, alcoholism, uh, the proximity of your bedtime date, which is, I believe, June next year. Uh, you have time to take some more programs, and I think you can really benefit from that project. And so my day today is Ms. Brown, you have two votes to deny your uh, parole. Uh, all three of us believe that you have a very serious drinking problem, substance abuse problem that you need treatment for, uh, and anger. Uh, those are the two things that have really caused all of your problems uh, over these years. So uh, uh, I hope that there's some programs there you can take before you get out. You're getting out. You have a good time release date of, of uh, 
of June of 2023, and you have a full term date of July of uh, 2023. So I uh, hope you take advantage of some programs there. Uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Wow. Well, I mean, I don't know if you're surprised, but uh, she's back locked up. She shows that she bonded out, but on 224, 2023, she was rearrested. It doesn't say for what Richard just has in the notes that she that she was. Uh, I mean, it's sad to say that I'm not particularly surprised, right? Um, but it's like as Miss Jackson kept unraveling that hearing, it kept adding on and on and on. Yeah, she has one felony, but it's incredible how many. I mean, she's just lucky that she hasn't killed anyone. When she gets upset, she takes out a weapon. And also, you just didn't feel any accountability. It was, you know, there was kind of like this attitude about it. And well, it's because men harm me. So I harmed them. It, the, the, I don't even, I'm not sure she was aware of the irony in her, in, in her statement of, all of my victims are men because they harm me. And it's like, no, all your victims are men because you're harming them. Uh, you know, just some self-awareness, some introspection. I, I just didn't get that vibe at all. And it was, and it almost feels like she's been kind of getting away with it for so long and things could really have escalated out of control. Um, Oof, I love that Miss Jackson took this case because she really, it really does seem like she cares. She tries to, to peel away each layer of the onion and get to get to the root cause of it versus so many other other interviewers. It's just like, oh, okay, you must have a, a, an alcohol problem. We'll send you to programs. But, you know, she was locked back out. She bonded out. I... I what I'm a little confused about is that she didn't have a revocation hearing. So is did I miss the part? Is it possible that she just completed her full oh okay, that's why her good time date was 6-24-2023. Uh, so, you know, Richard includes everything in the notes over here. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's not a parole violation. This could just be a new charge or just, you know, she bonded out and maybe so that's why we don't have her on the parole. That's why we don't have a parole revocation. Um, at least that's my assumption because that's her good time date. That's, uh, you know, I don't, it's, conf I don't fully know, but. There have been cases where I think you can bond out and then the parole officer finds out and they revoke you, but I don't think that's the case in this one. Anyways, I, I, I it's like, what more can I, can, can, can one say on this case? It really feels like, you know, she's not, she's not a, a child either. She's, she's, you know, it's not like she's a, a, a teenager. Um, all these things that she's doing, she's she's in her forties, and man, I mean, it is hard to imagine someone pulling out a weapon on you, and it's just like, oh, that's not the first time you've done it. But okay, um, if we do hear from her again, we'll play it. Uh, we'll play a follow-up, but thank you, Richard, and let's, let's move to the next hearing. All right. Norris Palms, DOC number 382214, second class offender, parole eligibility date 215-2022. Not eligible for good time, full term date 815-2051, 49-year, nine, 49-year, uh, six-month sentence. Uh, armed robbery is a habitual offender. Does that sound correct? Correct. Right. All right, Mr. Palms. How old are you? I'm 57. How long have you been incarcerated? For 20 years. 20 years on a 49 year sentence. Well, uh, 
What's, what do you currently do in the facility? What do you do there? I'm a, a orderly, a rec room orderly at night. I do the floors. So you're a trustee? Uh, no, sir. No. Do you have a GED or high school diploma? Yes, sir. <clears throat> did you get it while you were out or did you get it while you were incarcerated? I got it before I was incarcerated, sir. What grade did you drop out of school in? 10th grade. Why'd you drop out? Just running the streets and being wild. Were drugs and alcohol involved in that or what? Uh, no, sir. So have you ever had a drug or alcohol problem? Uh, no, sir. Never done any drugs or alcohol? I've done, done a little alcohol. Drugs never been my thing. Have you ever done drugs? Yes, sir. Well, tell me about this crime. It's pretty significant. No alcohol and drugs. What, what was going on? What, what were you doing? What was? Tell me a little bit about uh, what happened during this time. I had a, a gambling problem at that time, sir. And ran out of money and had to get some quick cash. And that's the way you thought to get quick cash? Uh, yes, sir. I wasn't doing much thinking at that time. No drug or alcohol, you're gambling at the time. Excuse me? So you're saying you just gambling at the time? Yes, sir. And that's, you know, just to get a little extra money, that's a pretty significant crime you committed, huh? Yes, sir. I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts about that, all these years you've had to reflect? Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I'd ever done that, you know, and uh, like I said, uh, since I've been incarcerated, I've stopped gambling, and I've noticed that's been my complete problem most of my life. Have you been gambling since you've been incarcerated? I gambled for the first three years that I was incarcerated. And like I said, once I reflected and seen that that's where all my problems were coming from, that's where all my altercations and everything else came from. So what, what, what have you been, you've been down a long time. What have you been doing since you've been in car? What kind of programs you've been taking? What kind of classes? What have you been doing to help yourself? I've done uh, the 100 hours. I've done anger management. I've done uh, substance abuse. And I've mostly done work. You know, I've, uh, I was a painter. I worked in, uh, you know, for the uh, paint metal fab at Angola for over five years, you know. And then I was a dorm orderly also after that, before I moved here. And I've always kept a job. I've, I've worked the whole time I've been in the incarcerated. So you've always worked. Have you taken, thinking for a change, living in balance, any of those type of classes? Yes, sir. Did you, which ones have you taken? Taken both of them? Uh, yes, sir. Well, what'd you get out of them? What'd you learn? What'd you learn about yourself, about your crime, about what, you know, what your plans are, what your triggers are? What my, my triggers are? Well, I, I've learned that, you know, I can't gamble. That, 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 is, that, is, that is a no-no for me. And, you know, and it, it causes problems every time I do. Like I said, this is where all my problems seem to stem from. You know, um, I learned a lot in, in, in anger management also, how to walk away for a change. You know, I've never, never even thought of that before. You know, everything was always a confrontation with me. You know, if someone got loud with me, then it's a confrontation. You know, I've learned, you know, to walk away. Like I said, I've been incarcerated for 20 years. I haven't had one single fight since I've been here. You've had, uh, what, about 12 write-ups? Is that right? Is that what I'm saying? I don't believe, I don't believe I had 12 write-ups at all. You don't, you don't think you had 12 write-ups? 13. 13, yeah, you're right. You had 13 since, you, since you've been there. Okay, uh, those are pretty minor. I'm, I'm pretty sure, huh? Uh, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're right ups. I'm just saying, you say you don't think you had 12. I'm saying you had 13 right ups since you've been there. You know, not not bad, I guess, for 20 years. Your last one was in 2018, according to this, a disobedience, right? Yes. It's 
So what's your plans? What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? What's your plans? Okay. My, my plans are to, to stay and live with my brother, who's a retired veteran, been, been uh, deployed five times. He has a few medical problems. And uh, we have a company called uh, Meridian Enterprises. You know, we do, we're doing uh, property preservation. That, that's what uh, my plans are going to be. That, that, that first of all, I'm going to be a medical assistant for him and uh, do that on the side. Okay. Warren, you have any input for us? So Norris has been at DCI since 2017. Um, the only write-ups he's had at DCI were the two uh, rule fours, which are the disobedience. Those are low court write-ups. Um, as far as programming, he's completed pre-release, anger management, and living in balance. Uh, I don't see where he's completed thinking for a change, though. I didn't see it either. That's all part of the hundred hours. No, it's a separate class. It's another class. The thing right. for a change is a separate class from hundred hours. All right, would you answer Mr. Maribel's questions? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Palms, uh, you indicated that you don't have a drinking or a drug problem. Is that right? I said I, I don't have a I don't have a drug problem. I did a little drinking, and gambling is, is my my biggest biggest problem. Okay. So. Well, tell me about your drinking. I mean, you've had several DWIs. Tell me about your drinking. Well, like I said, I, I tend to get to get tipsy every now and then, you know. Uh, but like I said, uh, I really didn't see drinking as a problem, but we usually never do, you know. And, well, uh, well, let me let me ask you. Now that you've been in prison, now that you've taken some programs, are you an alcoholic? Yes, I, I believe I will always be an alcoholic. So. Okay, well, I mean, so that's a pretty serious thing. Okay, yes, so sir. you got a substance abuse addiction in addition to your gambling addiction. Yes, sir. Well, tell me a little bit about, I'm looking at your record. You've got a pretty, you've had uh, 18 arrests, uh, a number of domestic violence, a lot of violence in your life. Why all that violence? That's, that's that, like I said, you know, that, that's always been my way to cope with things. You know, I've never well, learned what, beating to... up people. I don't understand. What do you mean? Uh, yes, sir. What's well, been I your mean, way of coping? Um, anytime I have an altercation and it gets out of hand, that's the first thing I always end up doing is putting my hands on someone. Well, what causes all of that? Do you know? It's, no, I don't. It's just a reaction. So you haven't taken any kind of programs to help you with that issue? Yes, sir. I well, tell, well. Well, what have you learned about that then? I've learned how to walk away. I've learned how to actually have a conversation without having to scream and, and holler at people. And I actually learned how to listen and he actually hear someone else's point of view. I mean, I'm looking at least four, five, six assault, domestic violence charges. Uh, have you taken any sort of victim awareness programs? I, I, I took the 100 hours in, in, in Angola. All those classes were in, in the same, same uh, genre. All right. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Robert Palms. Hello. Hey, go ahead, Mr. Palms. All right. First, I'd like to thank the uh, parole board for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Robert Palms. I'm uh, the younger brother of Norris Palms by about two and a half years. I'm a 30-year veteran of the armed forces. I've deployed to uh, combat on five separate occasions. And right now, I'm a disabled veteran. Uh, Norris Palms has been uh, uh, pretty much my rock for the, that entire time that I've been in the military. Uh, I've confided in him. I've, uh, it while in combat, had uh, wrote letters to him, and he wrote back to kind of keep me uh, motivated uh, so that I could kind of deal with some of the stressors that I had there. Uh, it is uh, it is my. Uh, desire that uh, my brother can come home and be my caretaker. 
Uh, I'm a divorce, a divorcee, so uh, I live alone. Uh, I do have a caretaker at this time, but uh, I'm only allowed to have a caretaker for 16 hours a day. Uh, I also own a company called Meridian Enterprises that I can't manage uh, due to my mobility issues. So I definitely need him, you know, where he can go out on site and make sure uh, that, you know, we're doing the board ups, the uh, clean outs and yard maintenance uh, and uh, things of that nature. So uh, I do have a home. I've uh, owned my home uh, for the last 15 years uh, here in Westlake. Um, so he does have a place to stay. Uh, pretty, I'm a, definitely a stable person. And I, I definitely think that uh, not only can I help him, but he can definitely help me. Uh, one of the key things is, again, having someone here with me 24-7 uh, just helps me, you know, uh, in preparing food, uh, whenever I have uh, needs as far as the restroom or things of that nature, uh, it's always good to have a male. Right now, my caregiver is a female, and uh, I'm about 230, 235 pounds, and sometimes it's a little challenging for her to help me in certain situations. So uh, I definitely uh, think that. You went on mute. You went on mute for a second. We were hearing you fine, but I can't hear you now. All right, I couldn't hear the very end there, Mr. Palms, but uh, you, you I, now, you, now I can hear you again. Okay, okay. okay. go I'm ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead and wrap up. Yes, sir. All right. So I, I definitely think he's been rehabilitated. He's uh, told, told me about the remorse and how, you know, he really regrets uh, the actions uh, of, of his past and how that, you know, he wants to do better and be a better person, uh, you know, and give back to the community. So All right. uh, we definitely have a strong support group here, uh, both family and friends that can put him in a positive environment and uh you know keep him on a straight and narrow so uh i really appreciate you guys giving me a time some time to speak and uh i appreciate you guys being attentive to what i had to say and like i say i hope you guys you know make a positive decision for him thank all right you. thank you thank you so much for your coming thank you for your so thank you for your service sir thank you so much we appreciate your service uh now we're here from mr james harris Yes, I'm James Harris, okay. and we want to thank this honorable parole board for giving us an opportunity to speak on uh, Mr. Norris' behalf. Are you hearing me? I am. I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm an honorable discharge Air Force veteran, married to Andre's, uh, uh, and I'm saying Andre, we usually refer to him by middle name. I am also his uncle, but I'm married to Norris, is the biological aunt, been married to her for some 46 uh, years. I'm a also a retired automotive uh, technician, and I've been in the gospel ministry for over 40 years. I currently pass the Evergreen Missionary Baptist Church in De Quincey, Louisiana, where Andre, where, I'm sorry, where Norris is a, a member, he united with the Evergreen Missionary Baptist Church, proud to be an incarcerated, was baptized, and was an active member. Uh, doing Bible study and also active in our men's uh, ministry. Uh, and I can't, want to speak on his, his behalf. He's, uh, I, I see uh, Norris as a good person. I've been in communication with him. I'm certain that he's uh, rehabilitated, uh, uh, rehabilitated himself. Uh, he's surrounded by a very good support uh, team, uh, both his family and, and his friends and also by his church membership, which is looking forward to him returning to us. And he will certainly be in, involved in our men's ministry where uh, they have a very good uh, accountability and responsibility uh, program. So we're looking forward to him being, being released and coming back. And I do, I do believe that he would be a, an asset to the community. I think he's ready now to, to lead a, a positive and a productive uh, life in, in society and take his proper place in, in, uh, in, in society. All right. Uh, 
proud to. Uh, all right, sir. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you for your for your service as well. Uh, now we hear from uh, Mr. Prejean or, or Mr. Erner, whichever whichever would like to speak first. Sure, I'll speak first. Uh, my name is John Turner. I work as an assistant district attorney at the Kakashi Parish district, district Attorney's Office. Uh, we oppose Mr. Palms' release as he committed four armed robberies in our community, which have left deep emotional wounds uh, throughout members of our community. Uh, I, I guess until today, he's never, today was the first day we've ever heard him accept any kind of responsibility and in a very one sentence say he was sorry for the acts that he committed. Uh, even as close to two years ago, he was saying that another individual had actually committed all four of these armed robberies. So from our stance, he's never accepted personal responsibility uh, for his own actions or how those actions affected the victims. At trial, uh, 10 people identified Mr. Palms, uh, and yet he still denied them the satisfaction of apologizing or showing any remorse for his actions or how those actions have affected them over the long time. Uh, I recently spoke with multiple victims, including Ms. Uh, Shana, who's uh, here next to me. Uh, I, some of them wanted to be here, but weren't allowed to be here, but what they, but a common theme was the emotional damage that he inflicted uh, on them. Uh, and so while he may not have physically injured the victims uh, through these, in these acts, but he did absolutely take some of their lives away uh, as he committed those armed robberies. Uh, basically, our office just believes that a release would be inappropriate. Uh, he, was all, he, he was sentenced to 49 and a half years for four, armed rob for four armed robberies as a second habitual offender. Our office feels that that's a just outcome based on the circumstances. And therefore, for those reasons, we would oppose the release. And now I'll let you speak with them. Okay. All right. Go ahead and make your comment. Thank you. And Norris Palm put a Glock to my temple and threatened to kill me exactly seven days after my 35th birthday. That day, my husband could have become a widow. My three small children could have been forced to grow up without their mom. And me, I have never even gotten a speeding ticket in my life, much less committed a crime. What gave you the right, Norris? to put a Glock to my head and threaten to kill me, repeatedly scream at me that you were gonna blow off my head. To speak, rob... to the, speak to the board, Ms. Prejean, please. Oh, I'm sorry. What gave him the ability to take away my right to practice pharmacy, to cause me to have PTSD, suffer anxiety and fear? Nothing gave him that right that day. Life is about choices, and Norris made the choice that day on August. It was a very bad choice, and it has lasted many of us a lifetime. That choice took away his freedom to, to do the freedom to be out in the public, and he has lied and refused to take responsibility for that action. He was 34, he wasn't a kid when he made that decision. No one put a Glock to his head and forced him to commit that armed robbery over and over and over again. He decided that. Not one time has he ever looked remorseful or acted contrite or attempted to apologize to us. We asked through his attorney, several of us did, if we could talk to him and see if he wanted to be forgiven for that so that we could possibly get past this traumatic event. But no, he never wanted that possibility. Just like this parole hearing, it's always been what Norris wants. I do not feel sorry for him. He was blessed with a very loving family that cared for him and he just spit in their faces and lied to him, lied to them just like he did us and said that we were wrong, that he did not do this. As for me, I have been in the courtroom with him several times and all he did is looked at me with hatred and contempt. Like if he could get his hands on me, he would kill me. Um, he was sentenced for 49 and a half years for the choices that he made. Um, I'm so tired of being re-victimized by him. Two years ago, we had to go to court again and it was the same thing. I don't feel like he deserves early release. I haven't gotten any early release for the, the trauma that I've suffered um, from him. Um, I never committed a crime that day. I went to work, I did my job, I did what I was supposed to do. I was supporting my family. 
And I just don't feel like that's what he deserves. I looked at the, the, what parole meant. Parole is a privilege, it says, for a prisoner that's deemed fit to re-interact with society. It's a promise that a prisoner gives to the parole board to avoid uh, criminals, drug dealers, not possess firearms, a Glock, not to commit new crimes, refrain from drug use, nor is with sentence under the repeat offender guidelines. And at that time, if my memory is correct, he was on parole when he committed this crime. That means he had been before a parole board, made these promises to people just like you all, but unfortunately he did not keep that promise. Therefore, this also shows he's not trustworthy. So I don't know why y'all would be willing to accept his word today that he's gonna keep the promises. I don't know that 20 years in prison has made him trustworthy or that you can take his actions today. This is the only time he's ever apologized or even admitted that he committed these crimes. Um, he used, I think he, the one thing he has learned maybe in prison is that next time he won't leave a witness. Yes, ma'am. To go to court. That's my fear. Okay, yes, my, my other greatest fear is that I will see him in his, on the streets of Westlake. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your comment. Thank you so much for your comment. Okay, now we'll uh, hear from Mr. Palms and we'll let Miss Madison wrap up at the end if that's okay with you. Okay, Mr. Palms, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yes, I would. And like, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, I would. Go ahead and speak yes, to the board. Yes, yes, sir. First of all, and foremost, I apologize to the victims and their families. I know what I've done was wrong. And, it, and this is the worst choice I've ever made in my life. And I've lived with it for 20 years and thought about it for 20 years now. I've been away from my family. I have a daughter that is now 25 years old. I left her at five years old. You don't think I've, I've, I've dealt with this? Yes, I admit I've been wrong and I am sorry. You know, and all I ask is please accept my apology. You know, and I humbly ask that you forgive. All right. Miss Madison. Um, good morning, you all. Um, thank, um, first, thank you all for giving um, us an opportunity to speak. Um, I want to, and, and I'll be brief because a lot of the things I was going to address, you've already addressed with Mr. Palms um, and his brother. His brother has addressed them as well. But an important factor um, to consider is, is age. Um, 20 years has passed. Um, Mr. Palms has been incarcerated for 20 years. Um, he served that much of a 49 and a half year sentence. He's 57 years old now. Um, during those 20 years, he's taken the necessary steps to better himself and to ensure that he's a productive member of society if or when he resumes life outside of prison. He's taken several courses and programs. Some of those he discussed with you all. Um, Something that he did not um, discuss was that, you know, he was over the 40 and over a basketball program when he was in Angola. Um, he assisted other inmates in learning how to read. He completed the prison rehabilitation, integrity, discipline, and education program. So um, th those are important things to consider. Um, he's certainly shown that he wants to better himself and become a productive member of society. He's realized his wrongdoing and is very remorseful um, and ashamed of his actions. And um, Mr. Turner and Ms. Prejohn mentioned court proceedings, um, court proceedings in which our office represented Mr. Palms um, as early as two years ago. He exercised his constitutional right to file for post-conviction relief. We addressed issues and issues with evidence in that case, as he has a constitutional right to do. He, was, he simply exercised that. Um, he does desire to become a better person, and, and in my opinion, he's done just that. He's made plans for life outside of prison, which is also very important. You've heard about those plans from Mr. Palms and also his brother. It's very clear that he has the support of family. Um, his mother, his brother, his daughter, he now has a five-year-old granddaughter. 
he has a loving family that intends to ensure that he does not repeat the same mistakes. Um, so as I mentioned, he's, 40, he's 57 years old now. I think the chances of him reoffending are very low. His only goal is to become a productive member of society. Um, he's a different person than the one that committed the offenses for which he was convicted and sentenced. The only question I think that remains now is, will his life be thrown away or does he get another chance to prove himself? Um, I think that rehabilitation is a goal of punishment um, that cannot be served if a defendant can only look forward to nothing beyond imprisonment. An important factor to consider is his willingness to accept responsibilities for his actions. He's done that today. Um, I think he started down a correct path by first acknowledging his wrongdoing and a willingness to accept responsibility. So I, I think um, that he is a good candidate for parole. I, I think the chances of him reoffending are very low. So we do respectfully request that Mr. Ponce be granted parole. All right, thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, is the panel prepared to vote? I'll vote first. Uh, Mr. Norris, um, you know, I, I had your case. I, I read through it intently, all the information that was in there. I listened to you this morning. Uh, you listened to the victims, listened to your supporters. You have a lot going for you. You, have a lot, you do have a lot of family support. You have a lot of good things going. You, you're taking a lot of good classes. You, you've done a lot of things. I mean, my concern is, again, I don't think you're quite there. I, I think that, you know, for me, I'd like to see you take, take it for a change. I'd like to think you take some victim awareness. Um, you know, take, you know, more accountability of, of uh, you know, understand. You may be a little bit more understanding of the crime, the nature of the crime and how it's affected everybody. But I think, you you know, again, take those classes. And so maybe for me, it, it would be different uh, next time you apply. But for today, my vote is to deny. I think you need to take victim awareness, thinking for a change. Uh, you have law enforcement opposition. Uh, you have victim opposition. Mr. Mayor Bella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Palms, uh, you know, I've, I've listened very intently to uh, what you had to say here today. And uh, to be kind, I think you've really downplayed who you are and what you've done. Uh, you answered Mr. Kelsey's questions early on saying, oh, I didn't have a drink and a drug problem. I was gambling. And then we find out you got a significant drinking problem. You indicated and you suggested, oh, I don't have very much of a criminal record. And you've got 18 arrests with seven or eight arrests for violence. I haven't seen, you have taken some courses and you've done some positive things, but I have not seen any significant substance abuse progress that you've made. Uh, you conceded that you were an alcoholic. I mean, I don't think you would have said that or admitted that, uh, but for the fact that we pointed out your record to you, uh, uh, I, I'm concerned about your honesty. I'm concerned about, you know, I, I do believe that you're moving in the right direction, but I, I do think that Mr. Mr. Kelsey is on the right track. Thinking for a change, MRT, things like that, that will allow you to understand who you are, what you've done, and how you can change. And you also need substance abuse classes and programs. You need to deal with your alcoholism. I mean, you've got three and four domestic violence things. You say, that's what I do when I get kind of crazy. Well, you need to address those things. Those are all part and parcel of rehabilitation. This isn't about punishment. This is about rehabilitation. And you're moving in the right direction, but you're moving slowly. Uh, I hope that you can pick up some good classes, and learn some more things about yourself. But today, my vote is to deny as well. So good luck to you. Ms. Renatza. Mr. Palms, I do agree with my colleagues. I don't believe you are all together forthcoming today during our interview. Uh, I agree that you need classes like thinking for, for a change in substance abuse particularly. So my vote today for those reasons is to deny, and I encourage you to reapply for another hearing after you complete those programs. Good luck to you, sir. All right, Chef, three votes to deny your parole. Today, your parole's been denied. Good luck. 
Wow, I I agree with Mr. Mirabella. I mean, he was downplaying everything, and it's interesting that you know we see a lot of oftentimes where they come up and they say they didn't have any problem, no drinking problem, no narcotic problem. And I don't really understand that either they're saying that because they haven't taken the pro substance abuse programs and they know they'll get denied or they think it makes them look better, but it doesn't make you look better. If you're completely sober, if you're uh, doing these violent robberies because you're saying that it's a, to, to, in this case, to fund the gambling problem, it doesn't make you look better. You know, when you don't, it, 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 it's easier to understand how people do it when they have, when they're feeding a drug habit, in my opinion. But he, and thank you, Richard, for sharing this. This details the string of crimes and it goes through, it, you know, from every date for the five different crimes that he was convicted of, June 28th. That day, a man entered a store and asked Pepto Bismol and asked about Pepto Bismol, <laughs> to which um, he began to respond. The next thing she knew, the man was behind the counter with his arm around her and he gunned her head. And these are such, you know, as the survivor, the victim pointed out, a glock to your head. These things can't be under uh, underemphasizing what kind of drama that does to you and how unnecessary that violence is. The man dragged uh, her into the back of the office where her boss was sitting at the desk. The assailant demanded all the big bills, and she gave him $250. Gilly gave him the money in his pocket. The assailant then put her in the bathroom and brought uh, her to the front of the store where he demanded money from the register. Eventually opened the register and gave the money inside. He then put uh, her in the bathroom and told her and Gilroy that someone was watching the building. <laughs> And killed them if they came out after the assailant left a lady entered the store they brought her the lady come from the bathroom and they call the police and then they talk about how how they identified him what they said he looked at then you go to july 18th 2000 so this is june 28th so this is just two days later um they say worked at at instacash approximately 5 30 p.m a man came into the front door of the business which was always locked as she instructed him to use the back door Peter did not immediately let the man in but did inform him what was required for a loan the man asked if he would be getting cash right away responded the man grabbed her arm forced his way into the building pulled out a gun and asked her to show him where the money was located She uh, sub subsequently pushed the panic button and called her employer. Police arrived and they described what, and then they talk about even here of the court case. Then you go to July 26. So this was 26 days later. And they talk about when he came in between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. She waited for customer. This is like broad daylight stuff. A young man then walked in, bent down to finish work, created by a previous customer, testified the next thing she knew. The man was behind the counter right next to her with a gun demanding money, and it seems he's attacking all female victims. On August 9, 2000, she was presented with a photographic lineup. So then we have the next crime, Third Way Pharmacy, August 8, 2000. Man came to the store, asked for the manager. When she turned the assailant beside her with the gun, the assailant then spoke with the manager. He subsequently brought Chapman and the two girls into the office where he held the gun to their heads. At least he never right fired the trigger, you know? They gotta say it's. It's uh, there's a lot here. I'll put the link in the description. But as you can see, the, the picture he tried to frame of himself and the reality of the situation were two different stories. And, you know, Mr. Maribella pointed that out quite succinctly. And you don't want to go into a parole hearing kind of completely lying and with a whole different attitude or viewpoint of what what you, it is that you're going through. And that's that's just what happened in this case. And plus he had all of those other 
what is it, 18 arrests, including DV. Yeah. But uh, there you have it. And with that, I'll let you go.